picked out a man that was sitting on the front row and went and sat down beside him. And as the service proceeded, every time the, the man stood up, he stood up, or if the man clapped, he clapped, or if the man sang, he tried to sing what he could, even though he couldn't understand the language. Later on in the service, uh, the man next to him who had, he had been following all through the service all of a sudden stood up. So uh, this young missionary recruiter uh, stood up with him as well. Suddenly a hush falls over the entire congregation. Several people gasp. The missionary looked around and, and seeing that he was the only one besides this man that he was following standing up, he quickly sat back down. After the service... Uh, came to an end. The missionary recruiter was uh, greeting the pastor or the preacher, and uh, the preacher said, I, I take it you don't know much Spanish. And the young recruiter replied, Is it that obvious? Well, said the preacher, I announced that the Acosta family had a newborn baby boy, and I asked the proud father to please stand. You know, in a foreign, in a foreign country, it uh, might be good to kind of know a little bit of what's going on. But in spite of that, sometimes there is some uh, humorous things. And I found out the secret when you get in a sticky situation. If everybody else is laughing, just laugh with them. <laughs> Amen. Evangelistic Faith Missions has been in existence now since 1905. And it was started back with uh, Lewis and Viola Glenn. And can everybody see from over here? I hope you can. Um, Lewis and Viola Glenn first went to Egypt under the group called the Pentecostal Band. And though they faced some opposition, including on one occasion being beaten, and they ended up leaving at least two of their children, one or two of their children, buried in the sands of Egypt, God continued to help them and bless them. Sister Viola lost her eyesight before she was able to return to the States. But we are very thankful for their uh, labor there and for what they did for God over there in Egypt. And due to that, the, Egypt in, 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 um, or the work in Egypt is still growing. There's approximately 60 congregations there in Egypt, and we thank the Lord for how God's been helping them. At the beginning of this year, they had a pastoral retreat. Forty-three pastors were in attendance, and three new pastors were ordained to the ministry. So God is still helping and we do thank the Lord for how that God is working over there in the country of Egypt. Not only in Egypt, but also in Eritrea and Ethiopia. We have several works um, between these two countries where God is blessing and helping. And we are very grateful for what God is doing. One of the things that I, unique things that I like to share is that uh, the nationals in Egypt have taken it upon themselves to go over into the country of Sudan and uh, help some of the refugees that are there. Not only that, but I'm sure they're presenting the gospel message in however way that they can. And that's exciting to see when the nationals begin to see it and take the, the burden upon themselves to go out and to reach someone else in another country. And so we thank the Lord for how that God is working. Over in the Caribbean, uh, Brother and Sister Middleton have been there for a number of years in the Dominican Republic. And then also from periodically they go into Cuba and God's been helping and we thank the Lord for how that God has helped in a special way there. Uh, the people are hungry. Uh, they're hungry for classes, what they call little workshops. And uh, one of the main things that they, they enjoy listening to is uh, talks on holiness. They want to learn how they can walk closer to God and how they're supposed to walk with God. And that's exciting to hear when people are just hungry to hear the gospel message, not only to know that they're saved, but also to know that they're prepared for heaven and sanctified and how to live a holy life. So we thank the Lord for how the God is working in the Caribbean area. Then on down into Central America, we thank the Lord for how that God is uh, helping in uh, Guatemala and Honduras and in Costa Rica. Uh, Guatemala has approximately 100 churches, and God has blessed there uh, in a very good way, and we thank the Lord for how that God has helped. Uh, presently, right now in Honduras, they are in their annual uh, camp meeting uh, there of the work, and we thank the Lord for how that God is working in a special way in these countries and down in, South, in Central America. On down in South America, of course, AFM is represented in the country of Bolivia. And we'll be sharing a little bit more about that here in just a, few, a little bit. Switching over to the Orient. EFM has been, had some opportunities to have contacts within the vast country of China. 
it's not always the easiest uh, country to go into as a missionary due to the society there of the, of the country. But uh, we thank the Lord for how that God has helped to uh, make some inroads into the country of China and given some opportunities to share the gospel message. And Brother, As Brother and Sister Asbury have been doing a good job, an excellent job uh, working there in China. And then also in India, uh, Brother and Sister Street just recently went back. And here again, it's another country where you can't go in under the title missionary, so to speak. Matter of fact, Brother Street was uh, mentioning to us here this last summer that uh, he does not even use that word uh, due for the family protection of, of his own family there. But God has given him an inroad to make some contacts, and he is able to uh, minister in different ways and share the good news of Jesus. And so God is helping. We thank the Lord for how he's helping them. Here in the United States, we thank the Lord for the Hispanic works that are part of Evangelistic Faith Missions over in the northeastern section, Delaware, Connecticut, and New Jersey. And God is blessing, and we thank the Lord. Uh, Connecticut just celebrated this last summer eight years of being in existence, and they had a, a time of a special service, and there was eight converts, one to Christ. So that's exciting to see. Uh, my wife and I had the chance to visit the church in Trenton, and I was very pleased to see the congregation that was there, probably about 100 in attendance, and how God is working amongst the Hispanics. And so we do thank the Lord for how He is working. Of course, anybody in this area has probably... Uh, heard by now, but yeah, last year in 2015, Eric Heimlich and Victory Inner City Ministries joined EFM and brought a whole new uh, dim dimension of evangelism to our uh, mission. So we thank the Lord for how God is blessing Brother Eric. Of course, his desire is to see uh, ministries in all 50 of our major cities in the United States, and God has helped him with Indianapolis and Detroit and Cincinnati, and we know that God's going to continue to work and help there. Of course, our our uh, vision statement, our purpose, our objective is to see people evangelized and discipled to obey the commands of Christ. Our focus is on people. Our desire is not only to see them get saved, but also to lead them into heart holiness and, and to have a personal relationship with God. And then second of all, our objective is to see our fields fully sustaining, self-dependent upon God, relying upon God for every, their every need. And God has blessed us and helped us throughout the years to do that with several different countries and different fields that we have mentioned already. So we thank the Lord for how the God is working. Bolivia. Bolivia is a down, way down south. Someone, uh, I've had several people ask me, well, how far is it away? Well, from Indianapolis is about a three-hour flight down to Miami, and then from there, from Miami over to La Paz, Bolivia, it's about a uh, six-and-a-half flight in the air, usually overnight. So by the time you get there, you're ready to stretch your legs after being cooped up in an airplane seat. So it is quite a distance away, but a very unique country in itself, and it has some very unique uh, opportunities. My interest in uh, Bolivia started back in 1996. Of course, my parents were missionaries in Central America for approximately 15 years as when I was a child growing up, and uh, mission work has always been close to my heart, I guess. So, uh, but in 1996, I had the opportunity to go to Bolivia uh, with a group of 13 other young people uh, under an organization called Touching Lives for Christ based out of Hope Sound, Florida. And uh, we really enjoyed our experience, enjoyed our time there. Uh, I can't remember every single detail, but uh, the three weeks that we were there, we took a few days with uh, another young man and myself and Sister Faith Hemeter. Uh, at the time, her and uh, Sister Irene Meyer were the missionaries there, and we went with Sister Faith up to one of the remote churches and spent some days uh, doing a vacation Bible school with the children and, and just interacting with the people. But I came back from that trip and began asking the Lord, one day, would you let me go back to Bolivia uh, to be a missionary if it would be part of His will? Well, of course, I graduated from high school, went off to college, and uh, continued praying, Lord, what, what is your will for my life? What would you have me to do? Growing up on the mission field, mission, missions has always been close to my heart. And that's kind of what I had worked toward or hoped for. And to be able to go back to the mission field someday. Uh, after I graduated in 2002, my wife and I took a pastorate here in Kokomo, Indiana. And I pastored for about three and a half years when uh, a need was presented to us about opening a school in San Pedro Sula, Honduras. 
So we uh, said, Lord, if you open up a door, we will be willing to go. And God did open up that door, and we moved in 2008 down to San Pedro Sula, Honduras, uh, to begin this private uh, bilingual school. We started the first that fall uh, with five students, and uh, I'm thankful to say that within the last four to five years, they've had an enrollment of close to 40 students. And it's nothing that I have done, but it's all what God has done. And we thank the Lord for how that God has helped and, and worked. And I believe maybe in a previous occasion we had talked about our trip to Honduras or preparing to go to Honduras. And those of, several of you that have supported us in prayer, we just want to say thank you for that. Um, there were several times when we knew that God's people were praying for us back home. So we were very thankful for how God helped us while we were there in Honduras. Then we came back to the States here in 2012 and been seeking the Lord's uh, direction. And last year, Brother Hyatt approached me and said, Stephen, what would you think about going back to the mission field again? And uh, my immediate response was, well, Brother Hyatt, what do you have in mind? And he named a couple Central American countries. One in particular was Costa Rica, where I'd grown up, grown up as a child. And then he said, well, what would you think about Bolivia? I said, well, Brother Hyatt, uh, what you don't know is, is that I've been asking the Lord to open that bad door. And uh, if this is God's will, then we're willing to step through it. Well, a little to my knowledge, after I left back in 1996, uh, Sister Faith him and her and Sister Irene Meyer both decided that they are going to start praying that God would send me back to Bolivia one day to be the missionary. So I'm here as a direct answer to prayer to them. Most of all, we're here to serve God, and, uh, and we thank the Lord for how that God has directed. Sometimes we haven't always understood the way that God has led. But I have found that when I keep my hand in his and just take one step at a time, he opens the door, I walk through it, and then he takes care of the rest. So I'm thankful for how God has led in my life, and we are looking forward to go to Bolivia. At this time, my wife's going to come and share a little bit uh, about our trip that we made here a year ago. Well, it's a privilege to be here this morning. This, yeah, this morning. I don't know what it is. Forgive me, Emma. I'm starting over on this baby process. My brain's not working too well. <laughs> um, it was a privilege to be able to visit Bolivia. Um, you know, when you go to a foreign country, you quickly realize that it's just not like home. Just not like it is here. There's a lot of differences. Um, some good, some bad. But if I could take you to Bolivia tonight, you would quickly realize that there's some things that are just a little bit different than they are here. Of course, uh, living in Honduras, I knew that there was going to be some things different, but I was surprised by even quite the differences of Honduras. But the first thing is you land in Bolivia. You um, Well, let me back up. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about Bolivia. Um, first of all, the population there of the country is almost up to 11 million people. It's a lot of people in just a little area. Um, it is a small country that is landlocked by the surrounding uh, countries there. Also, in La Paz, where we will be working, um, the population there is about 2.3 million people. Considering the area of land that that covers, that would be the outskirts, not just the, the middle of the city, that would be the whole uh, department of La Paz, um, that's a lot of people for that area. And so, um, causes a lot of traffic, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. One um, distinct thing about La Paz, Bolivia, is its altitude. It's about ranging from 10,000 to 13,000 feet above sea level. So when you arrive, you uh, step off the plane, and you notice real quickly that you're breathing just a little bit different than you normally would. Um, they say at that altitude, you're uh, breathing about 60% of what you would normally breathe, breathe down at the uh, sea level, or where we're at. And so you don't rush off and try to be the first one to grab your luggage. You walk a little slow, and you find out what it's going to be like when you get older, and it just takes a little longer to walk, and a little harder to breathe, but um, this is um, something we're going to have to get adjusted to, but the altitude there is very high. And, uh, of course, the people that are born there don't know any difference, but us Americans that go there just have to pace ourselves. And uh, they, you'll see in the airport, you'll see people running around with oxygen machines for the people that just quite can't handle it. And sometimes you have to be in oxygen for a little bit till your body levels out. But uh, this is something that's going to be a challenge for us. 
Um, also, one of the beautiful things there is a huge lake called Lake Titicaca. And what's interesting about that lake is it's the highest lake in the world that you can go on boat. It's the highest navigable lake. It uh, borders different countries there. And they get a lot of trout out of that lake. Those of you who like to eat fish would like to uh, come visit us. We'll see what we can do about finding, I don't know if we'll go fishing for the fish, but uh, we may assume we buy some for you. Um, beautiful lake there. Also, uh, Bolivia is unique because they've had a lot of different uh, people that have immigrated there over the years. And they say that they have 36 official languages. Now, not all of these are spoken. Some of them have kind of faded away and are extinct. I'm glad because I would not want to have to learn 36 languages. I'm doing good to learn or uh, speak Spanish. But um, there is two groups of people that are the majority of the groups there, and they're Indian groups, and they're called the Quechua and the, uh, the Aymara people. And the people we will be mostly working with, most of our churches are associated with, are the Aymara people. And we'll talk about that just a little bit more in a minute. Um, those that say they're re let me go back one second. Those that say they're religious, 95% um, of them that call themselves religion, religious, are Catholics, and the rest would be um, evangelicals. And of course, that covers a lot of different religions under there. And so, um, uh, Holiness Missions has a big job there. Um, I'm glad that we serve the one and only God, and that all these other religions they think they have it right, but um, I, we have a big job to do to show them that Jesus is the true way. As I said, the people we're going to be working with are the Aymara people. Now, if you go to Mexico or Honduras tonight, you probably most likely would not see people running around in their um, tr like cultural, what we call their traditional costume that they would bring out for a special parade or special occasion. But the Aymara people are still very much uh, steeped in their culture. And so you would see people dressed like this on a normal occasion. Um, Mexico, Central America, they would dress more like we would. But these people still um, dress very culturally. The ladies, they say their skirts are about six or seven layers of material thick. Um, how would you ladies like to carry that around? Uh, they say they're very heavy. But the reason they dress this way, one of the reasons, I guess, is because it's very cold. Now, as you came in with your coats on and came into a nice warm church, uh, imagine what it's going to be like for us in Bolivia when it gets to be winter time and it's 30 and 40 degrees and we don't have any heat in our house. And none of the people have heat in their house. They would have stoves or um, fireplaces or different ways. We hope we have some space heaters or something because it's, or some uh, electric blankets. But um, it's very cold because of the altitude. The season is different, the opposite of ours because they're below the equator. And so right now as we're getting ready for winter, um, they are getting ready for summer. And so, good place to go if you want to stay warm, come to Bolivia. But their warm would be, the highest would be about 70, 75 degrees. So it doesn't get real hot there, so it's just comfortable. So um, I guess we'll be comfortable in the summer and cold in the winter. But uh, one of the adjustments we will be making. The Armada people is very interesting because the older generation does not speak Spanish. Spanish right now is the predominant language that is taught in the schools um, because of all the different languages that they had to adapt one. And so Spanish is the one they've, uh, most, most of them have adapted. But the older Amada people do not speak Spanish. They speak Amara. And so you go to service and you can just expect that the preacher will get up and he'll read the scripture in Spanish. And then a person that speaks Amara will get up and read the scripture in Aymara. You will sing a song in Spanish and then you will sing the whole song again in Aymara. If you have an American there that needs translation, they will translate from English to Spanish to Aymara. And so you can imagine service gets quite long when you have to do everything two times. But this is so the older generation can understand and participate in the service. And our challenge will be to learn a little bit of the Aymara uh, language there because you go up and start talking Spanish to them, and they start talking in, in language that sounds very foreign to you, and you just nod your head and hope that they think you think they understand, you understand them. But um, we will be trying to attempt to learn at least a few phrases so we can communicate with them. Oh, one other thing I did want to mention, you notice that all the ladies, uh, I'm going to get back there, have, or all the pictures, except the one on the bottom, have hats on. 
Why would they wear hats? Well, these aren't necessarily wool stocking hats to keep you warm. Because of the altitude being so close to the sun, um, they ha wear hats so their head won't burn. So your whole body can be freezing cold and your head can be burning up. So they recommend that you wear a hat so you don't get a sunburn, even though you're all wrapped up in sweaters and everything else to keep warm. Um, also, another thing you will quickly realize when you land in the country, or any country, you're going to realize that traffic is just a little bit different than it is here. Do they have rules? Do they have stop signs? They sure do. But do they pay attention to them? Not always. It's usually whoever has the biggest horn or the big, can wave the biggest out your window or uh, whoever can scoot their way in quickest. Traffic is very interesting there. This picture is not very clear, but you can see the, sh the sleeve of my husband's arm there. We were sitting right in the middle of an intersection. And we had traffic coming at us all four directions, blowing their horns, and I just knew we were going to get hit. And one of the sister, brother and sister Middleton, who are missionaries Dominican, they have been going to Bolivia a couple times a year just to keep contact with the people there because there hasn't been a missionary, and they were there at the time we were. And uh, she would sit in the back, and she'd scream, oh, there's a car. We're going to get hit. And I thought, well, there's no sense in two of us screaming because I felt like screaming too. So I just had to pray, Lord, please protect us and get us out of this. But he did, and I'm thankful for that. You know where God leads you, he does protect you, and he does, and he does help. But when you pray for your missionaries, that might just be something you could add on your prayer. Lord, help them as they travel around the country because travel sometimes can be very stressful and um, very different. Also, um, because of all this traffic, there's a lot of people moving around. And so the government has tried to help issues by one day a week, according to your license plate number, you cannot drive to the city. So if you're, it's Thursday is your day according to your license plate number and you have to go to work, how would you get to work? You would have to take a taxi or a bus, um, which the other people that don't have vehicles would do. And so the taxis and buses are full of all the people that can't drive to the city on that day. And so there's a lot of traffic moving around. So the um, country has come up with a better idea, they think. And they have developed this uh, system of cable cars called Teleferico. And um, there's different colors of cars, different uh, lines. And they would, these cars would pass through different terminals. They start at the top of the mountain, up at about 13,000 feet and make their way down to the lower parts of La Paz. La Paz is built like into a canyon. Um, the houses look like they're stacked up the mountain. And so these uh, cable cars would um, run from the lower parts to the upper parts. And depending on where you need to get off in the city or where you need to go, you would take that color of car um, and get off at the appropriate place. Those of you that love heights and love, you have been in a ski lift or like these kind of things, you would just get a thrill out of these because they're very, very high. My husband and my, uh, his opinion and my opinion are different about how high they are. He doesn't think they're as high as I think they are. But um, they're very scary to me. I'm a person that likes to keep my feet on the ground. And so the day that we got to experience this cable car, I told my husband, well, you just uh, take the pictures and show me later what I missed while well, I closed my eyes. But uh, if you want an adventure, come visit us and we'll, my husband will take you on these cable cars, not me. Um, so, when you go to a foreign country, sometimes you uh, wonder what you're going to eat. You've heard some horror stories that missionaries like to tell, you know, pull out all the stops of the, the worst stories they can tell about people that were, had interesting experiences, like the monkey head they had to eat and all sor sorts of things. But sometimes you can get into some interesting experiences when you uh, have put a plate of food before you that you've never seen before. And when you pray, Lord, please bless this food, you really mean it. And please, Lord, um, turn off my taste buds or something so I can get this down. But uh, while we were there, we didn't have a whole lot of time to try a lot of the food. We were only there for about five and a half days. But we did get to try some trout out of that lake I told you about. And we went to a couple of restaurants and got to try some, some food there you can see. But the real interesting meal was when, on Sunday when we had a church dinner. Now here you have a church dinner, and we look forward to that because everybody brings out their best casseroles and their best desserts. You know, you want to show off the best that you can cook. And, um, well, this church dinner was just a little bit different than the one I've been to. After church, we went all went outside, and um, they started gathering in a circle around the perimeter of the property there. And I noticed quickly that nobody um, had a seat, and nobody sat on the ground. They all squatted down. Like they were used to doing that, obviously. This is their tradition. 
and this would be obviously the Armada people, the Indian people. Um, and then I noticed that the president of the work of our church work down there was um, he had a blanket in his hand. He was going around to the different ladies, and they were dumping stuff into his blanket. And I wonder what in the world are they doing? And pretty soon his blanket got nice and heavy, and he went and he dumped the contents onto a sheet that they had uh, laid on the ground there. And I quickly realized that that was going to be our lunch. You ever heard of dinner on the grounds? Well, that's what was our lunch that day. Um, and then we quickly realized that we didn't have any plates, no forks and spoons, um, no nothing to drink. You know how sometimes you have bad food and you swallow it down with a drink? Nope, we weren't going to do it that day. Um, but what did God give you ten fingers for, right? Kids, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't eat with your fingers because they do in Bolivia. And so after we prayed, the people went up to the sheet and they just started scooping up the food. Some had a little bag, little kids, they'd put their food in a bag. Um, my husband was telling me this trip he just took a couple weeks ago. He saw somebody brought a big pot of rice, and the kids were eating rice with their fingers. No utensils, but it didn't seem to mind. But most of the food on that sheet that day was potatoes. Well, you think, well, that's, most people like potatoes, right? Not too many people stick up their nose at potatoes. Well, there was boiled potatoes, and there was some um, yuca, which is like a root like a potato. There was um, some cheese and some different things. But let me tell you about a couple of these potatoes that we ate. One potato is a black potato, and it's called chuño. And the other is a white potato, and it's called tunta. The chuño is uh, harvested, and then they lay the, uh, the potatoes out on the ground. And as I said, it's very cold, especially at night. It would freeze, and these potatoes would freeze as they're laying there on the ground. The next morning, the sun comes out thaws out the potatoes, and the people go out with their bare feet and stomp on their potatoes to get the liquid out. Um, gives a new meaning to mashed potatoes. And <laughs> that night, the potatoes freeze again. The next morning, they stomp on their potatoes again. They say it takes about five days. And then they have freeze-dried potatoes that they store for a long time. When they don't, their crop isn't growing, they can go to their storehouse of potatoes and uh, have something to eat. And the missionaries get to try them too. The other potato is the tunta. It's processed in the river, is what they tell me. Somebody asked Sister Faith uh, Maurer, and, uh, yeah, Hemeter and Irene Maurer, uh, which they preferred, because they'd been there for several years. And the one lady said, well, she really didn't like the black potato because she, when she eats it, it tastes like sneaky feet. And that's kind of what I think it tastes like. And the other lady said, well, she would rather have the black potato because the white potato is processed in the river. And you ever thought about what they do in the river in foreign countries? Yeah, they bathe their cows and their cars and everything else. And so these are some of the foods that we will get to enjoy. And if you would choose to come visit us, we would gladly share with you. Um, while we were there, we also got to visit some of the churches. And what was interesting to me was the way they construct some of their churches. La Paz, I said, is very populated. They um, build up with their buildings. They may have a business that's three, four, five stories high, and they need a house, so they'll put a house on top of the business because there's not, especially in the center of La Paz, now that wouldn't be in the outskirts where the villages are, but this is be, talking about city. Um, they have to just keep going up because there's only so much room you can build on the side of a mountain. So their, their buildings are very tall there. But also their churches, they build um, some of them three stories high as well. And it was interesting to me, their thought process of how they build these churches. The first floor of their third story building is the, usually a kitchen. They are very, they like to be social and they like to have get together. So it's very important for them to have a kitchen or maybe um, some of the rooms would be Sunday school rooms. Um, the second floor would be a parsonage or more um, rooms to be used for the church. And at the top is the sanctuary. And those of you that uh, struggle a little bit getting up a step or two, can you imagine climbing to the top of this third-story building every time you have to go to church? It would be a challenge. I didn't hear the people complaining. I did hear the missionaries puffing and grunting because they had to climb up. Uh, we had to climb up those steps at that altitude, not used to it. But uh, thankfully, they warned me that the bathroom was on the first floor before I climbed clear to the top. I thought, well, they have a method to their madness. People would not be running in and out of service to go to the bathroom. It's a long ways down, and it's a long ways back up, let me tell you. 
So um, this is just an interesting way that they construct their churches there. But what is a privilege of ours while we were there, Brother Stephen Hyde was with us, and he was giving classes on holiness, and it was just, um, I don't know, here in the States, I guess we give altar calls and people don't come and they don't come, but there he was teaching about holiness and the people were just so receptive to the message. And it's, you know, sometimes we think here in the States, we have the message, we're the people that, you know, have it all, but there are people around the world that are ser searching for Jesus and searching for a better way of life, searching for um, a clean heart. And so the message of holiness isn't just here in our, our United States. It's around the world. I'm thankful for that. It's because missionaries before us have gone and told people about Jesus and uh, the message is being carried on. And the people there are hungry. They're hungry to, for as my husband said, they, they're asking us for teachings. They want to know more. And so it's going to be, our, Lord willing, our privilege to be able to take the message and share the good news that Jesus, yes, he wants to save you, but he wants to cleanse your heart. And he wants to establish you spiritually. And obviously that's the secret of any Christian life. And it's the secret of any uh, church work that uh, people be established so they can go on and be leaders of the church there. Also, while we were there, we had the privilege of teaching Sunday school. Quite a different Sunday school classroom than you would see here. Uh, we were all crowded in one little room. One little boy there in the corner was eating his breakfast. Nobody seemed to mind. Some of the children didn't have a place to sit. And the Sunday school teacher, which was me, didn't have even 12 hours of warning that I was going to teach Sunday school. I didn't even have any, I didn't have uh, visuals, nothing. But uh, I just used my imagination. It was exciting to teach the children that morning and watch them trying to listen to this gringo study, stutter over her Spanish, but um, it was a privilege to be able to work with them, and Lord willing, that is one of our goals, is to work with the children. As you know, uh, the children are our next generation of leaders, and as we would talk to the different pastors, they would say, I remember when Sister Faith was here, or Sister Irene, I got saved at a vacation Bible school, or I got saved at a Sunday school, and now they're the leaders of the church work there, and so Lord willing, we want to have a part in that as well. 2.3 million people is a lot of people, and we can never even uh, attempt to reach all them. But God can help us to reach one or two, and he can lead us to the ones that he wants us to uh, touch. You know, I was, as we were on our way here, I was reading a story, and it was about a lighthouse, a little old rundown lighthouse, that um, had rest, was rescuing many people. And it became a very popular lighthouse. And as it became popular, the people started noticing, started, you know, news reporters coming, and they wanted to fix up the old lighthouse, so they started fixing it up and making it fancy. Well, as they did, the people started um, being proud of their fancy lighthouse, and they started having parties there and became a club. And pretty soon, they forgot about all the people that were dying out in the water because they were so busy taking care of this beautiful lighthouse and I thought here at Christmas time, sometimes we're so busy doing our thing. We're so busy preparing our houses and doing all the things that we have to do. But we forget that there's people out there that need him. And so may the Lord help me. May the Lord help us this Christmas. And uh, not everybody can go to be a uh, different country be missionaries, but we can be missionaries right where we're at. So may the Lord help us this Christmas season and throughout the new year that God would help us not to, for to forget about the people that are still out there. Um, if you go to a foreign country, you will, don't know English, or don't know Spanish, I'm sorry, you will have to have a translator. They call them interrupters sometimes. And you know, have you ever thought about the little sayings we have in English that just might not translate very well? Well, Hannah's going to come, and she and her dad are going to share a little dialogue with you of what it might like to be, what it would be like to sit through a translation, but don't worry, it's all in English, so you won't have to learn Spanish tonight, but uh, what it would be like to... Uh, go back and forth with these different sayings that we have in English. Got one here, yeah. Sorry about that. Good evening, ladies and 
gentlemen, welcome to the service. Tonight we have a special guest all the way from, from America to speak from his heart. Please welcome Brother Stephen DeLong. Uh, he does not know our language, so I will be his interpreter. I'm so glad to be here in your beautiful country. I am just so happy to be here in your beautiful country. You have beautiful oceans. You have a beautiful ocean. And beautiful trees. Trees. And to you beautiful ladies. To the peoples. I, I would like just to say I thank you for the lunch you gave me. Thanks you very much for the food that you prepared for me today. I'll have to admit, however, I did have some butterflies in my stomach about the food you fed me. I'm sorry. It seems that our guest has had some flies in his food today. We must be very careful not to let the flies get in his food now. The food was great, though. I really did enjoy it. Oh, he liked the flies. I tell you, I'm just tickled pink that you, want, you wanted to share your food with me tonight. What? Tickled pink? Tickled pink. Oh! It seems that our guest has developed a rash from the food and it's making him itch all over. I'm just ecstatic about the topic that you want me to speak on tonight. The message that you have asked me to speak on tonight is making me stretch like elastic. The topic of how to get people involved in spiritual ministry. The topic for tonight is how to get people to minister to spirit. See, there's too many people running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Oh my, where this man comes from, there is a great persecution of the church, and the people let their heads cut off like chickens. Their testimony ain't worth a hill of beans. They don't even get paid vegetables for preaching the word of God. It's time to get on ball for Jesus. It's time to play sports for Jesus. Part of the trouble is you pastors. Part of the trouble is you pastors. You just don't wait on God. You don't wait on God. You're always jumping the gun. Okay. They take these guns, they lay them on the ground, and then they jump on them. And then you shoot off your mouth. And then they take the gun and shoot their lips off. Then you turn right around and stick your foot in your mouth. Then they take their foot and stick it right in their mouth just to stop the bleeding. Then you have these, this big problem of people being lazadaisical. Oh, uh, they have this problem. What? Being lackadaisical. Oh, I think it has something to, to do with laxatives, but I'm not too sure. There is a great disorganization. There's a great trouble in the church today. Sometimes people arrive an hour late. Sometimes people come just to hear the preaching. Pastors, you need to give them a reason to be glued to your seats. If people are leaving your church, you need to uh, take something sticky and put it on their chair so they can have to get up again. I know how it is to get ready for church. I know how it is to get ready for church. I too am a pastor. I am a two pastors. It's early Sunday morning. It's early Sunday morning. The kids, they're out in the yard and they're as filthy as pigs. What? What? The kids, they're as filthy as pigs. Um, okay. There seems to be these baby goats, see? And they are in his yard and they look like pigs. You bring them in the house. You bring them into your house? Well, yes. You bring them into the house and then you put them in the bathtub. You do? Well, sure. Okay. He takes these goats and he puts them into his bathtub? Then you begin to peel the mud off of them. Then he take a knife and just begin to cut the skin off. The kids, they're climbing up the walls. Now these baby goats, they're running, trying to escape, and they're running right into the walls. Your wife, she's trying to fix up her hairdo. His wife thinks there's something wrong with her hair, and she's trying to fix it. But Satan, he's still attacking. Satan, he's still attacking you. Well, you step outside, and it's pouring cats and dogs. This must be a curse or something from a witch doctor. Because you step outside and these tiny animals, they start falling from the sky. And your wife's hairdo hits her right in the face. What is a hairdo? Hairdo. Uh, um, okay. His wife, while she was walking, all of a sudden got hit right in the face with a Honda. 
It's enough to make your head spin. And then her head rotates. It's enough to drive you bananas. And then she was thrown to a banana tree. Then you, you finally get to church. Oh, hallelujah, he finally got to church. Folks, you just ain't thinking about God. No, how could you? Excuse me, you are not thinking about God. You're mad with your wife and your kids. He is he, he insane at his wife and these little baby goats. Then you begin to chew your wife out. He is so insane that he begins to bite his wife. You finally get on the platform. Finally you get on the platform. The people are sitting there like bumps on a log. He sees the people like they are knots and holes in the wood. Your wife, she's trying to smile. His wife, she just tried to grin. But everyone knows that you just got done chewing her out. But everyone can see where you have bitten her. They're just wrapped up in what they think worship is. When they worship, they take these prayer cloths and they just wrap themselves up in them. But it's really just a bunch of baloney. It looks just like a sausage. That's not serving God. Give me a break. God does not want a sausage. God wants a broken spirit, something only prayer can do. You, what you need is to get on fire for Jesus. You need to burn yourself for Jesus. It seems like there's always somebody coming around to quench the spirit. God will send somebody to put out the flat fire. Well, I see the clock is flying, and I better come to a conclusion. Oh, this brother just had a vision of a big clock, and as it was flying past him, he ran into a concussion. What you need to do is get into your closets of prayer. Closet? Yes, what? your closets oh. of prayer. Oh, yeah. We need to go to the shower to pray. It has something to do with the rain of the spirit. I don't know. You don't need flaming evangelists. You don't need to buy the evangelist as a sacrifice. You need to get a hold of the horns of the altar. Wait, what? Horns what? of the altar. Uh, okay. Now, these baby goats are back in church again. And it seems you have to grab their horns so that the people can pray. We, what we need is pastors with guts enough to fast and pray. Now, you pastors with the bigger bellies, you need to fast and pray. You pastors have got to hang in there. You should be hanging yourself. Now, if you'll follow my words. Now, if you'll preach this message. The power of the Spirit will sweep over you. God will hit you with a broom. And he'll sweep over your congregation. God will hit your people with a broom. And you will find yourself spiritually walking in the promised land. And you will find yourself in another country. Every word I have preached is in the Bible. No. Yes, every word of it. All right. Everybody, just go like this. He believes every word he's been saying. I hope that someday you can come to America and be as much help to me as I've been to you today. I hope that someday we can all go into America and help to straighten out this man's theology. I can sense that by the look on your faces and the look on my interpreter's face. He can tell by looking at you and looking at me. That this message has not come across very clearly. That this message has been rather stupid tonight. But please understand this. But please understand this. People are lost and dying without Jesus. People are lost and dying who have never heard about Jesus. You and I must go, give, and pray. While you and I, we must pray, we must give, and we must go. And tell a lost world that Jesus still saves. And tell a lost world that Jesus, he still saves. This is the message that all can understand. And how true that is. Amen. Amen. All right. Give us a second here. The kids are having a special number and song. Lord, I gave my love to you. Day 
control each day. I will follow anywhere, near or far away. Here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. I will serve you faithfully. Here am I, Lord, send me. Lord, I want your perfect will. Be my faithful guide. I will never be afraid. true that is just around the corner there's someone else that needs to know about Jesus thank you Hannah and Daniel for sharing that in song this evening my wife mentioned uh, part of her desire is to continue and encourage the uh, local children's work there in Bolivia and she mentioned the, some of our leaders that are presently there were saved back during uh, the missionary ladies ministry there but um, part, of the, part of what our thoughts are on trying to, on the purpose of going, first of all, there's approximately, there's about 15, 13 to 15 churches there presently already. They do have their uh, national board with the national uh, superintendent who's kind of overseeing the work as a whole. So we do thank the Lord for how the God is helping in that area. But uh, we want to try to, first of all, um, get to know them a little bit, learn their culture, and start building relationships with the leadership and then also with the pastors and then do what we can to try to be an encouragement to them. Uh, each, each leader needs uh, some times of encouragement from time to time. So we want to do our part to, to be able to encourage them and help them. But then also uh, part of our uh, plan and goal is to be able to see how God would help us to uh, help the work to go forward. Uh, there's been some talks about or there's, they've asked me uh, a couple different occasions, would you come and open a church? Uh, would you come and help young, the young people? Or would you help out in the Bible Institute, which we thank the Lord for uh, the institute that is there and some of the young people that are preparing for the ministry. Well, that's fine, but I'm only one person. I can't do everything. So uh, I want to see how God would direct and lead me and give me wisdom to be able to encourage and help the work. But we would like to see it to grow. We would like to see it uh, to go forward and see some new opportunities and preaching and, and some new churches opened up. So I don't know what all God has in mind, but I want to do my part to just continue to follow his leadership and do my best to encourage the work as a whole uh, as best as I can. Also, another uh, thought is to try to see how we could uh, uh, see about work, moving the, the work to be more dependent upon God and to rely upon him, self-sufficient. So uh, I don't know what all... Is, that's going to involve yet, 
but I do know that God's going to help us. Uh, please pray for us that God will help us as we continue to prepare to go. We are looking forward to going. We're Right now we're planning between sometime into February 1st part of March uh, to go over. One of the reasons is because of the altitude and uh, the different in climate to try to adjust to the altitude a little bit before it gets too uh, cold at that high altitude level. So do be praying for us. On your way out of service, if you wouldn't mind picking up one of our prayer cards, if you do not have already gotten one uh, prior to the service, and uh, take it home, put, us, put it somewhere where you can remember some prayer. One of the unique things I like about these cards is that there's a little tab at the bottom that you can tear off and put in your favorite book or your Bible, wherever you're reading, and to uh, see how God would help us uh, in the future. A couple things that uh, we are uh, praying uh, that God will undertake. One in particular is that we are in need of a vehicle. Uh, the vi mission vehicle, it's there presently. Uh, it's a 1994 model and uh, was there when I was there and back in 1996 on my TLC trip uh, and is showing its wear and tear. So we are asking the Lord to provide for us a vehicle uh, to be able to travel around with the family and visit the different churches and see how God uh, can use us to be a blessing to the word. The other thing is, is that uh, we are asking the Lord to uh, supply our every need, our financial, and uh, we do. We are trying to raise some support. Approximately, uh, a pledge is around twenty dollars a a month. If uh, you'd be interested in that, you feel free to talk to us afterwards, and we'll be glad to give you a little more information about that. But uh, these are just a couple of prayer requests that I leave with you that you could help us to pray that God will continue to work on our behalf. If you do not uh, know much about Evangelist of Faith Missions, we do have some information back at the table, including uh, Missionary Herald. And uh, I believe there is the current issue back there on the table. If you've not received one and would like to receive one, you can sign up for it and then grab your new edition uh, there at the table. And... Uh, be informed from month to month of what God is doing with the EFM across the world. There's also a sign-up sheet back there uh, for a person on a newsletter if you would uh, like to receive some news and update on what God is doing in our lives. <clears throat> Thank you once again for the privilege to come and share a little bit of what God is doing in our lives, and I trust that we can be a blessing to you. Just in closing, I want to share a few thoughts from uh, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8 here this evening. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. You know, prior to this verse that I read in the first seven verses of this passage of this chapter, we find Isaiah, first of all, that he recognized that he was a man of unclean lips and he lived in a society of unclean lips. He lived in a world that, even in his time, was not wanting to serve God. They had all their own ideas of who God was and what God was going to do for them. And uh, they wanted to do nothing with the one and only true God. And I believe that that would be very pertinent to our society that we live in today. It seems like everybody around us doesn't want to have anything to do with God. But I am thankful that God is still in control and that there are many, not just a few, but there are many that are still wanting to serve God. But Isaiah recognized where he was at and the condition that he was. And first of all, he recognized who he was. Then second of all, we find that Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on his throne. He heard the angels crying, holy, 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 because God is holy. He saw God's glory as it covered the earth. And uh, you know, this, my friend, this evening, God is all-powerful, and He is holy. And without Him, we can do nothing. When we come before an all, uh, God, an almighty God, and kneel before Him, first of all, we need to recognize that within ourselves we are nothing. But then we can quickly realize by doing that, that with God, He is everything. He is the, everything that we need. And he is all-powerful and, and all-knowing. Not only that, but we also find that Isaiah quickly recognized that he had a job to do. You know, over in Matthew, there, as Jesus was getting ready to ascend into the heavens, he told his disciples that he was leaving, but that he would leave a comforter. But not only that, he also told them, go and teach unto all nations. And you know, as a child of God, we have a responsibility, and that is to share the good news of Jesus with those around us. 
Christmas is my probably favorite time of the year. One, mainly because the fact that it's a time to remember of Christ's birth. But then it's also a time that in the midst of all of our gift giving, we can remember and be reminded once again that Christ gave the ultimate gift, and that is the gift of his son. Why did he do that? Well, so that you and I can be saved, so that you and I can have a personal relationship with God. You know, that was the whole purpose from the beginning of time. God created Adam and Eve in order to have a fellowship with them, to walk with them, and to be their friend. And God still wants to have that personal relationship with each and every one that would accept Him as their Lord and personal Savior. So our part of our job is to go out and to share the good news with someone else. As my wife mentioned already, now all of us are called to be a missionary. But we also have a responsibility right here within the four walls of our county, within our community, to go and share the good news, the gospel message with someone else. So I would like to encourage us this evening that on this Christmas season, let's do our part to let someone else know that Jesus still saves, that Jesus still satisfies, and that Jesus still wants to love them for all of eternity. Thank you once again for the privilege to be here. We'll turn the service back over to our sister. Right, we're going to come to you for an offering. Bobby, come, I need two helpers. Isaiah, you want to do offering? Here. And uh, Kaylee, here's a offering plate. Bobby, there's one right there. All right, go ahead. and change in where they live. All right, and we got news from Nathan that Grandpa Smith made it around a little bit before seven. So Mr. Smith's gone and all the siblings have gathered in. So just remember Smith family, the Hennis family, and probably the Hyatt family here in the next few days. today. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Anything else we need to announce before we dismiss? All right. Well, let's stand and we'll close with prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this service, this mission service. Thank you for the message of the gospel that came to us and that is being spread in all areas of the world. Thank you for your help. We pray for these families that are hurting and grieving in this Christmas season. Remember the Smith family, the Hennis family, and be close to Brother Hyatt and his family, just, you know, Tom's family. Just give guidance and give wisdom and help them. We know that you you care and you walk alongside of us in these difficult times. Thank you for all that you've done, for what you're doing. In your name we pray. Amen. Right, you're dismissed.